Well, welcome to yet another episode of Flip Your Friday. I'm your host, Wynn Silverman. This is my co-host, Casey LeBlanc. And, uh, oh my God, I'm very excited today. We get to interview a an iconic sports figure in Brandy Chastain. I mean, when I think of certain moments in sports, it's funny, my brother's out there in the audience today. Uh, we were talking about just iconic moments. And for him, coming from the Bay Area too, and I want to get into a little bit about the Bay Area roots, but I got to tell you, uh, Dwight Carr... Dwight Clark, the catch is something that brings myself, you know, brings to mind something. But you know, your moment uh, that we want to get into later of of that goal, the winning goal, and on everything that that was about. And I think there's a lot to talk about there. It wasn't just the action; it, it was what what it meant deeply um, to you. I'd like to get into. But for now, um, if you don't mind, let's just start a little bit about um, where you're from and go a little bit about uh, some of your accolades in your career because it, it dovetails into what this podcast is about, which is what uh, doing just really, really great things and what you need to do to win. Oh, my gosh. Well, number one, good to be here. I love a good flip, so this is yeah. fantastic. <laughs> uh, sometimes you got to do that. Well, I, I don't know. I was just a regular kid growing up in South San Jose. Mm -hmm. uh, Immediately, my parents and I recognized that I just loved being outside, mm -hmm. being active. Physical was like my jam. And my grandfather so desperately wanted me to play golf. My mom wanted me to play tennis. And I didn't think those two things were either aggressive or physical enough. And I loved to get dirty. And soccer just so happened to come around, thankfully. Like, it was the universe speaking mm -hmm. to me. And... When, when I signed up, um, nobody wanted to be the coach. <laughs> and so my dad said, okay, like, okay, I'll volunteer. He didn't know anything about soccer. And so we learned together. We went to the library, San Jose local public library. We got wow. the four books that they had. We got the one VHS tape that, that tells you how long ago it was. Wow. And yeah. there just so happened to be one program on Sundays, Soccer Made in Germany, and we would watch it. And I just found it really fascinating. But I didn't see myself in the future. I wasn't looking like, okay, this is what I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't, I didn't see it. And I don't always believe that you have to see it to be it, but it definitely helps. You know, it, it gives you some pathway potential. Um, but I think, you know, there's pathways out there that, that, you know, you're going to forge, you, the listener, us, yeah. you know, here in this room today, that you can't see. And you're just going to have to trust your gut, your instincts, and you're going to go for it. Um, and that's what, kind of what I learned as, as we went along this journey. And luckily for me, we had the San Jose Earthquakes sure. playing at San Jose State yeah. uh, at Spartan Stadium. And that place became kind of my refuge to, like, like I could feel my soul just, like, getting full, right? Mm. And yet I still thought I would be an NFL player <laughs> because that's what my dad watched on television. And sure. I saw that, and I like football. So I thought, I'm going to do that. And so you mentioned something really interesting that a lot of what this podcast is is aimed towards is is these moments in life. And when did you start to recognize how did you start to recognize this was a path? Was there something that you did? Was there some event? What, what kind of walk us through when you knew, hey, this is this is going to be something for me. I, I really wish I was like s that intuitive and that <laughs> smart. Um, I don't think I had that vision, but I just knew sports made me feel good. Did you just keep plugging? I just kept just playing. And it wasn't until I was a junior in high school at Archbishop Mitty, and they said, hey, you have to decide between playing softball and playing soccer. You need mm. to, if you want to keep going in college. And I was like, I, I'm not deciding. I love playing. Like, yeah. why do I have to do that? I just want to be an athlete and have fun. I just, you know, exactly. And so it kind of came to that time, and I was like, oh, well, it's definitely soccer. I mean, I love, I, I really enjoyed softball, but I, I knew soccer was my thing. And... I mean, if you think back to it, I mean, right now, this is the 50th anniversary of Title IX. This is a big year. Um, and so w even though we've been 50 years post-1972, I really feel like this is the jumping off point. The NWSL, WNBA, you know, women in sports are really finding their footing. You know, like the roots are really going deeper, deeper than they ever have before. And so I, I think now young girls like me, who find themselves being athletic or finding physical activity as, like, their thing, 
now have at- outlets, right? But for me, it was, I just played because it made me feel good. I didn't do it because it was going to be my career. I didn't do it because I thought I would find fame. I did it because I was better than most people. And I enjoyed just that challenge and that competitiveness let's, that I had. Let's fast forward a little bit because I, I, I want to definitely hit about Title IX and, and, and women in sports because it, it is a fascinating and great opportunity, finally, uh, for women to really spring into something that should have been there many, many moons ago. Um, but so, look, you, you went to Medi, you excelled. Uh, you got a scholarship at what, Cal first, That's right? right? Um, what happened here? It didn't sound like it sounded like you had a good team at Cal, but some, you, you met some adversity there. And then just talk a little bit about your pro career, because then I think what that does is dovetail into everything else I want to talk about is how you succeed in so many other facets. Well, Cal was a great opportunity. Uh, my parents and my grandparents, you know, every generation before me, no, nobody went to college. So this was an opportunity in my family and they were thrilled. Uh, and I think down deep inside, I also was thrilled, but I kind of had this feeling like it wasn't really the right place for me, even though mm. when I got there, soccer started at the same time school did. It was very overwhelming. You know, I wasn't I wasn't this really well-rounded, out-there person. Mm. You know, I, I loved my sports. I loved my family. We kind of did those things together. And so I found myself in this really big open world with lots of languages and different people, anybody doing whatever they wanted. And I was like, wow. Especially at Cal. Yeah, especially. <laughs> and in a, and for me, actually, it was a really great life experience. Mm. Um, unfortunately, after having a really good freshman year, I tore my ACL in the spring. Mm. And so I had to redshirt the next year. And then I realized as I was kind of plodding along, and this happens to a lot of people, and maybe it's in sports or maybe it's in school, maybe it's in some other way. In business, you know, yeah. You, yeah, you realize, like, maybe this isn't the place for me. And I think change is really hard for most people. Mm. I... Because I think of the things that I've experienced, I really love change. Like change to me is an opportunity. It doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means that you're gonna you're going to travel another uh, direction. And so I came home and I went to a junior college, a local junior college, to get myself sorted out. Realized that Santa Clara, even though when I first thought about Santa Clara, I was like, no way, it's too close to what I used to do. Yeah. Yeah. It turned out to be the place he, that was really good he, for me. He walked down the street from Bellarmine to San Jose State, so you guys must have a, a, a lot of things in common. But I do have a specific question on on change and what you're talking about. I want to touch on that. Mm-hmm. I think that was really important because for me, th- what's the distinction between recognizing, for example, that life is dynamic and, yes, you need to sometimes pivot and, and, and the possibility that you failed at something, just recognize that you failed. Like, yeah. we're, 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 I mean, you know. Well, that's, you... A, it, that's an interesting word because I think, you know, mo- all words have connotations, right? Some mm-hmm. have negative, some have positive, And sometimes I think we get in a rut feeling that connotation. And I, for me, I realized that, yeah, I could sit here and say I failed at that. I failed in my pursuit of a degree at Cal Berkeley. But then I realized, like, I excelled in growth mm. and a growth mindset. And most people would stick with something even though they weren't either happy, successful, it w- or they, they found complacency and comfort. And for me, it was, I, I have to try something else. Mm. And I was, luckily, I was born into a family who was willing to say, hey, try whatever, you yeah. know, give it a go. Yeah. Just don't stop. Yeah. Keep pushing. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, especially right now, and I want to get your take on it. The, the youth are really quick to pivot. They almost mm. they pivot too much, mm. right? As soon as there's an adversity, they pivot. So it sounds like you went through and you had a, a good season and then you got hurt. What was, like, walk me through kind of the way you see it back then and the way you see it now with the youth. Because I know you're involved with, with coaching and, and teaching young male and female athletes and, and younger generation. What do you think as far as that dynamic where people are social media, it's instant gratification. Hey, mm-hmm. if any, if a coach, you know, screams at me, maybe that's not the right coach. There's, there's a dynamic there that is different than what it used to be. Where, where, how did you recognize that a long time ago? What do you think about what's going on these days? Well, I, I know that things have changed and I think culture is changing. And, you know, we were talking just a moment ago outside the booth about uh, an author and a scientist by the name of Angela Duckworth who does a lot of scientific studies about grit. Grit is one. That's the, the book. I just met her in person two days ago or yesterday. And I'm fascinated by this because her, she was giving a presentation to 
uh, a company blend about, and this company is, you know, they talk about loans and mortgages and credit cards and how do you build your, you know, your personal portfolio of, you know, you know, maybe owning your own home or starting a business. And, you know, when do you decide to leave your path and when do you make change and when, when is grit not the thing to, to pursue? And so there, there are, there's no one answer. So for everybody out there, there's not, this is not me telling you that there's a stopping point for something. Um, There's a lot of variables that go into it. So uh, I, I, I honestly believe what the culture shift has been is because of technology and the way things, because they're moving so fast, I think that lends itself to the pivot. Hmm. It lends itself to going from one place to the next. Um, you know, even the CEO um, of Blend was talking about, um, you know, startups come. They're, they're coming fast and furious. And so, you know, you, you want to be on the edge of whatever that technology is. You might have to do a lot of pivoting. And so yeah. your skills over time need to change. So it's not the same. And as a coach from before, <laughs> I will say, you know, I grew up in a different environment with different coaches. And, yes, loyalty seemed to be something that was really critical, right? You stay with something because you believe in whether it's the mission, whether it's the people, whether it's the product, and you see it through. And whether it's up and down, you know, it's kind of like sitting at the blackjack table. You're going to lose some, but you got to outlast the wave. Right. And you're going to come back around and you're going to find gotta, the Got to go win. for a hot shoe. Yeah, you got exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's, it's finding the compromise, right? It's finding the compromise. What's the sweet spot in between, you know, wanting to – get in, get out, and staying the long haul? And can you find the place in between? So, so here's what's interesting, uh, if you don't mind. It, it, it's been on my mind. Your career, okay, so let's just say you did Cal, you did Santa Clara. There, there's some accolades you, you made, but you, you got cut, right? Yeah. You, you got cut from a team, and then you decided in your, let's just call it your era, where I would argue that women's sports wasn't nearly as prevalent as it was today. There wasn't a whole heck of a lot of outlets for you after college to be able to play ball for money. Right. But somehow you found a team, right? Yeah. Uh, Japan, just, would you just walk me through that, that sure. final kind of moment? Um, because I think that's interesting because it's right to what we're speaking about. You didn't, you didn't pivot. You stayed with, with, uh, with sports when at that time, I, I'm sure a lot of people go like, you're, you're nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I, so graduating Santa Clara, you know, we had a great, Two, I had a great two years at Santa Clara. We were in both um, College Cup weekends. We were the number one team in the country, undefeated. So we had a lot of success. Um, we didn't win a championship during that time, but thank goodness we, we've had two now and one yeah. very recently. And, and our program has really been elevated. Um, but when I left, there was still this desire to play. And I played on the U.S. Women's National Team, and we won the first ever World Cup in 1991. Very, We call it kind of the anonymous World Cup because not very many people really knew it was happening. Huh. And even FIFA itself wouldn't call it a, technically a World Cup. It was the M&M's Friendship Cup of the World Cup of FIFA. You like, you know, so, yeah, they <laughs> it was, you know, they wanted to test it out. Like, we, we don't really believe in women's soccer, but we kind of feel pressured that we should, and so this is what we'll do. So it was great. It was a wonderful success, and it born, um, because of that, we had two world championships before the next Olympics in 96. But to your question, after the 91 World Cup, I was, I was a substitute. I wasn't a full-time you know, starting player, and I got cut from the team. The, the coach decided to bring in some other younger players that were playing in college. Like you said, I had exhausted my... Um, my collegiate, you know, years. And so I was playing in like an amateurish post-college league. Mm -hmm. And someone presented this, said, hey, there's a women's professional league in Japan starting. What do you think about that? And I love travel. I love going new places. I've always been enamored by different languages and different culture. And I said, I'm interested in that. Yeah. And so I was the... I was a full-time assistant at Santa Clara to my husband, uh, not at the time, but husband now. And I had to make a choice. And I said, you know what? I still want to play. I believe I I still should be on the national team. 
And so I went to Japan. And it was the best life experience. I would say to any athlete, any student, if you have a chance to go and live in someone else's shoes for... For more than a two-week vacation. Yeah, yes. <laughs> go. Yeah. Go and immerse yourself and get it wrong and, you know, learn some new words and travel on yeah. public transportation. And it, it was phenomenal. It, it really shaped... It really spoke to the player I wanted to be. Uh, their style of play, the graciousness of their culture, the kindness. But it also allowed me to bring kind of my Western mentality and share that with some other women for them to say, oh, we don't have to just take what's being given. We can ask questions. Yeah. And, you know, it was really great. So, I, I, go I, no, I got to, I got to, <laughs> we've, we've had some great, great people on this podcast. We've been lucky enough to ask them questions about leadership. So you talk about the Western ideals as well as uh, in Japan and kind of bringing both of those together. Mm -hmm. I'd be remiss, and I'll forget if I don't ask it right now, but we'll talk about leadership just really quickly as it comes to that. Leadership born or bred when it comes to yeah. sports, business, doesn't matter. What are your thoughts on leadership with both of those in mind? Your experiences lend, lend to yeah. something, yeah. a unique perspective. Well, I think you're saying leadership like it's the one person. So I, I feel like leadership has many iterations of itself. So it's not just the person who has president on their door or manager. It really, leadership belongs to everybody. And to me, le leadership has a little bit of a synonymous nature with advocacy, right? And allyship. And so it really exists everywhere. The thing about leadership that I love is that it will creep up on you and then ask you to be a leader when you may be least expecting it. Or ill-prepared. Or ill-prepared, but just know that you could potentially change someone's life. Right. That happened huh. for me. So, you know, we're playing in the World Cup. It's the quarterfinal. Everything has been riding on. The future of women's soccer depends on the U.S. women's national team winning the World Cup, not making it to the quarterfinal, not making that, it that to... That doesn't the, matter. Yeah, you have to... You have to win. Did you know that at the time? Yes. Okay, so At you're aware. Time, yes, very aware because every single media outlet was, there's always the naysayer who's like, you know, this, nobody cares. Nobody cares. It's going to be Eminem's uh, side cut. Whatever, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, nobody cares about women's soccer. Why do you think this is going to be any different? What's going to be the lasting impression? And, you know, y you probably need to win. And so that was in the back of our heads. But luckily, we were doing some work with a sports psychologist about control the controllables. You know, you're only in charge of the things that you, you know, you have to use your tools in your toolbox. Don't get out. Just don't get too far away from what it is you know you need to do. So we ha we're really lucky in that way. That's but great. six minutes into the quarterfinal, Germany plays the ball between the center back and myself. And as it's flying over our head, I look to see where the nearest opponent was, and I in my head, I'm like immediately like, I got this. I'm closer. I, I'll beat her to the ball. It's not going to be a big deal. But we're playing in, at the time, it was Jack Kent Cook Stadium. Now I think maybe FedEx Stadium for the Washington yeah. Commanders. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And that stadium is right on top of you. It's very loud. And it was very hard to communicate. And I didn't. Neither did the goalkeeper. I passed it. It went past her and into the goal. Ugh. And now we're down 1-0 in the quarterfinal. And the future of women's soccer, not just my future, but every generation of young girl after that. And that's probably a collective feeling through your teammates. Like, oh, you yeah, guys are probably. It. I mean, I wasn't looking at anybody at that moment. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. probably not. If you're saying stay in the moment, you know, you're probably trained, you're, or at least you're trying you to know, block a, all that's that a, out. That's a big problem. So yeah, what happens? It, it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. So, like, to your question about leadership, like, even though Carla Overbeck was our captain technically, you know. What she didn't know that morning was she was going to really have to come to the aid of one of her teammates in a way that never, it rarely happens, right? Own goals rarely happen. Yeah, that's, that's rough. <laughs> and so, and especially at this, in this game. So she came right over, she clapped her hands like she does, and I looked up and I knew it was her, and she said, don't worry about it. We've got a lot of game left, and you're going to help us win. Wow. And I thought, oh my gosh. Yeah. You got it. Like, she literally... Pick me up. And, mm. you know, you can imagine the things. Like, as soon as that ball went over the line, it was like this collective 80,000-plus oh. fans Going, gasping. Yeah. 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 And then every four-letter word after that, you yeah. know? Like, yeah. and then I don't – I shouldn't have been put in this position. I, I'm not Everything good enough. All the negative you. things, right? Sure. So th God. that – to leadership, you know, leadership is not owned by one person. It doesn't look like one thing. It's not something you can buy. It, it really is life experiences. It's willingness 
to put yourself out there in support of someone else. It's willingness to put an idea out there in a way that helps other people. It's very selfless leadership. Uh, the way I see it and the way I've experienced it. And so, you know, to your two points, like, um, I don't know if it, it, it's, it belongs somewhere ev in every single facet. Um, and I, I hope that leaders, meaning like coaches or managers, allow and facilitate leadership at every level so that that empowerment all of a sudden grows better people. Well, and I, I, I really agree with you. I think it is like, because parents are leaders. Right. Yes. And people don't follow titles. They follow people. And I think if the if the intent there is to learn and get better and have a lot of the, the characteristics that you just spoke about, leadership can be learned and you can be really good at it. You don't know when you're going to be called. Yep. And so that's an interesting point. So in that moment, I'll just go back to that for a second. You get picked up. What did that, did that, I mean, how impactful, like, is that one of the biggest things in your life? I mean, from an athletic <laughs> standpoint, it's not necessarily the goal, but maybe that moment that gives you the confidence to, like, can you I, touch? I call that adversity. Well, can you touch on that? Because <laughs> yeah. that moment, right, yes. is, it could be life changing. No, it absolutely was. And I have said to Carla many, many hundreds of times, like, you changed my life. It's etched in my head mm -hmm. forever. It's just like my grandfather's mission to teach me that giving is better than getting. And he yeah. did that because he saw me as a young girl truly thrive off scoring goals. And I would knock my own teammates down to get the ball to go to the goal. <laughs> and Sounds he's, like him. He's like, no, I'm just he'd be like, you know, if, if he was like a friend, he'd be like, dude, you're really a pain. Right. Like, you're not yeah. fun to play with. Yeah, like, receivers are always open. Yeah. Yeah. Same yeah, thing. Throw yeah, me the ball. So, so, so what he taught me was, you know, he gave me a dollar for a goal but a dollar fifty every time I got an assist, wow. and so it really those you know those two moments really that's amazing were in, are in my head. And how many times have you paid it forward? With I mean, it, from that moment on, every <laughs> every interaction, right? Yeah. Like it just like I'll remember this conversation, and that'll have an impact on me and hopefully people that are listening. Yeah. Like that, you're right. The assist, you get more money to assist. It feels better to have somebody else succeed. That leadership portion of you're at your lowest point. Instead of, you know, the hammer where you're just yep. crushing them on the head, it's the, hey, pat okay. them on the, yeah, pick them up, lift me up. That's not the moment for the hammer. Right. That, no, it's after the fact. That's a retroactive response to something that you might have been able to help if you yourself were maybe thinking ahead, right? So, yeah, it's, you know, I think about it every single day. It's a part of the fabric of who I am as a wow. person now. You know, I, I, I get countless pieces of mail, every day it's been 23 years i i get so many pieces of mail can you please sign this and you know if they write a letter like but, all response but, but, all but it wasn't for kicking that goal no not for that goal yeah it was yeah, for well, a different well, one keep going on the stories then yeah like, so what happens <laughs> well i mean obviously we win that quarterfinal right yeah and i score another goal in that game as a fact for my team, thank you. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> well, yeah, two, two goals for Germany is not going to go over well. <laughs> I got two goals I want to relive game. this whole game. It's, it's just awesome. But. Yeah, so, you know, I ended up – and actually the celebration of that goal um, was something that when I see that picture and that video, I think that was – that was an, a, a celebration that had a lot of emotion to it. Like my, my post – penalty kick goal was a little bit different, right? Um, but this one was like, I was so happy that I could contribute in a positive manner. In that game. In that game. Because, That's right. you know, you feel this great sense of responsibility yeah. when you make an error. And you don't know if you're going to be given a chance to make it up that Rede soon. Redemption. Yeah, it was really That great. is amazing. That, and so that, that could propel you into that that the confidence to go back and say, Hey, you can go one of two directions at that moment. Oh, she, man. she pats you on the back and say, Hey, you got this. You yep. can do yeah, this. And you say, yeah, I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> and, and then, well, no, not that, but you, she does that. Then you score. Then it's like, okay, I'm back and not only back, but I've gone through this adversity and also just did something with it. And that person in that moment who picked me up has a huge like responsibility for what you were able to accomplish. So then get us to, yeah. you know, this, this moment where, you know, every, you know, most people know you for, for one moment, but it was actually maybe that moment in that time where you went through the struggles and it could have been really quick. You for the, yeah. You just told us that you differentiate this in a lot of different ways. That moment, 
and the moment we just talked about. So talk about what was different emotionally after you had obviously your iconic moment that most people see and most people kind of recognize recognize you globally about. Well, I, I do want to I wanted to call attention to one thing that my husband shares with his athletes all the time with the Santa Clara women's soccer team. And that's this, it's kind of a funny term. And when I use it, like when I'm coaching Bellarmine high school boys and I'm coaching youth girls and I say this, they all get a chuckle because we talk about optimal arousal, right? And, and when we work with like, when you, (laughs) when you, you know, we work with sports psychologists and we talk about this optimal arousal, which is like, you're never too high and you're never too low. And so you're going to have these these peaks and valleys and what you hope is that they start to level out and now you've got this kind of consistency that you know things could go bad things could go wrong but you're still going to maintain this composure and the knowledge that you can do these things right and so getting to the final we play we're playing China we're in the Rose Bowl it's like one of the most iconic stadiums in in this country it has so much history but women's sports in this stadium um, doesn't really have a footprint. And so this is a big deal. And it's packed. It's packed. We got 90,000 plus people. We get there actually, and they don't do this anymore, but back in the day they used to hold the third, fourth place game right before the final. So we get there, and now Brazil is playing Norway, and now we don't get to warm up on the field. So it's your uh, biggest game uh, of in your life. It's the future of women's soccer is, yeah, you know, no it's hanging in the balance. Yeah. And – now you don't get to warm up on the field. Now what do you do? So our, our, the arc of our story is so phenomenal because it's not what you planned. And, yes. and I will say to everybody out there, you know, we talk about leadership. We talk about winning. We talk about change. We talk about these things. And I can really guarantee that it's not going to go exactly how you thought. That's what you can guarantee. Yes, that's what you can guarantee change. (laughs) And and you're going to have to be agile and flexible. And so going into that game, never did we think like, oh, it's going to go to penalty kicks. But we had two phenomenal teams. And what I love to say about the game is that these are two teams that bent, but they never broke. Like literally, they got pushed to the brink. We were in the overtime. And at that point in World Cup soccer, it was golden goal. So if anybody scored, the game would be immediately over and they would be the winner. China gets a corner kick. The ball gets crossed. Their player out jumps our player, heads the ball, and Brianna Scurry, who was our best goalkeeper, phenomenal, could just get to anything. She was like a cat. It was incredible. She leapt to get it and it was just barely going past her fingertips. And now here's the mundane everyday thing that most people overlook which i i have consistently and will consistently for the rest of my life talk about the details matter christine lilly i've seen her play 354 games with the national team and never once in a practice and never once to that point was like 100 and 20 games had i see her ever have to make a play standing inside the post but that was her job so before that kick came, she could have said, like, oh, I see some danger out there. I could have gone away from my job. I could have said, you know what, this is boring. I'd never make a play here. I'm going to do something else. But she was there, and when it went past Bry, she jumped and she headed the ball out. Otherwise, that game would have been over. over. Wow. So, you know, talking about, you know, winning culture and winning mindsets and, you know, how do you win championships, the details. The details, the details, the details matter. And now we're getting into now – the penalty kicks. And so, you know, this is a fun story because, you know, as um, I was the designated penalty kick taker in the run of play, but Michelle Akers was out, and so she wasn't going to take one. So the assistant coach came over and said, okay, uh, you're going to take a penalty kick? And kind of questioning, and I said, well, yeah, sure, of course. (laughs) Like, I found it very odd because I would have taken one. So (laughs) I said, yeah, and luckily I didn't spend much time that must have helped your confidence, it. yeah. Well, I mean, it was, you know, luckily, I'll tell you something. Here's the thing that sports has also taught me. Don't get worried about things. Like, things just only use the things that are going to f- help you. That's right. Confidence. You know, your, your, yeah. your, your aperture on your, on your lens, you're in control of that. It's either really closed or really open, and you get to determine what gets through that filter. And so, whatever. Like, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. Then the head coach comes around and says, okay, you're going to take a penalty kick. And I said, yep. I talked to Lauren. He goes, okay, you're going to take it with your left foot. And then he, like, ran off like the roadrunner. And it didn't really 
honestly, I didn't digest it in the way that I think if I hadn't been exhausted from yeah. 120 minutes of play, yeah. I probably would have been like, what the hell are you talking about? I've never taken a penalty left oh footed in a game. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I just – I. I think because he brought me back to the team, we had a really great trust, you know, a, a good relationship. He could say something to me, you got to do this, maybe do that better, but whatever. Have you, ever, have you ever asked him about this? Like, hey, right in the middle of, have you ever had the conversation? Like, because you're going, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> like um, in that moment, and then you just do it, right? Just same thing. The lens, you're like, hey, this is my coach. He probably yeah. knows. I just do it, and things worked out. But did, have you ever had the conversation with him? Have you ever asked him what the hell he was thinking? Yeah, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, uh, and I wish I had asked yeah. him but i honestly i think the reason i didn't was because he knew it would be fine yeah. yeah and he trusted me and he and because he brought me back to the team i think that was um you know i really when he changed my position he changed my yeah. perception yeah. like i had a resurrection and i just felt like i'm pretty fortunate like yeah. this guy he wouldn't put me in a position to fail why would he yeah yeah right so i think that's another thing that we in sports we learn and hopefully with leadership we learn is that people don't put people that they need things to get done in positions of fa to fail yeah. they might put you in a position to be stretched or challenged but they believe and in grow you. but they believe in you mm -hmm. and so I, I think that's really important did you, did and, you, and for me that was with your left foot? i did so <laughs> earlier in the year <laughs> you too earlier, let's go yeah, <laughs> early, <laughs> yeah yeah earlier in the year we played china i got the ball there was a penalty i put it down and when i stood up the goalkeeper was standing right in front of me like two boxers right in the middle of the ring and she kind of smiled and winked and she's a really funny character yeah. great goalkeeper gao hong is her name and she went back. The referee blew the whistle. I kicked it. I was kind of out of sorts because psychologically yeah. I was like, what the hell is she doing? Yeah. It hit the crossbar. It went out. We lost the game. So the only thing going through my head as I was approaching this final kick was don't look at the goalkeeper. Don't give her that opportunity to do this again. Wow. And so mm -hmm. you'll see when you watch the, the yeah. replay that I never lift my eyes. I never look at her. Like I can see where she is out of my periphery, but I, I don't lock eyes Focus. with her. When, yeah. when you are, just really quickly, when you are kicking a penalty kick, do you, are you in, in normal situations, are you looking at the goalkeeper at all? Or in your head, you've already predetermined exactly where you want to go with the ball, regardless, irrespective of where that goalkeeper is? Yeah, I am going to only answer from my my perspective because I think for some players, they do it a lot differently. Sure. I had an idea of where I wanted to put it, um, but I think there is, again, like I said, when you put that down and you back up and you can see where they are, nah, you know, some, sometimes if okay. someone has, is leaning, maybe. But okay. I had already decided, like, this is how I wanted to hit it. Um, when I watch it back, I think, wow, that was a little too close to the side. It, it went into the side netting. <laughs> yeah. But it, it goes in every time, and thankfully. Then, and, then, <laughs> and then what? So what? So, you know, everybody talks about this. You take your shirt off. You yeah. know, now that's it's not, you know. And it was a reaction, right? What? You, what you, yeah, what was that, this? At that moment. Just visceral. What was it? Yeah. Um, You've never told this story, right? <laughs> yes. I, I, I've told it, but I think every time I tell it, I feel like it, it, it comes alive in a different way. Depending, that's awesome. Right? And um, I, I'd love to say that it had some, like, it was intentional in its meeting, but it really was just a this outward expression of relief huh. and joy huh. and satisfaction and gratitude wow. because, it, I mean, that was a journey. That yeah. was a journey to that place. It wasn't a sprint, and it was, I mean, it. and I will tell you, on the video, it looks like it lasts for a long time. In life, it was like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It happened that fast, and then yeah, the team. Yeah, was all together. those words, all those words do depict uh, empowerment. I mean, it, it reflects mm -hmm. the concept of empowerment organically, and then, and then, and that really truly is what set women's sports. I feel on on such a in such a, a vertical climb. Mm -hmm. If if you don't disagree, I don't know. Where do you think women's sports are today, and where do you think uh, where do you think it's going? Are we going on a positive trend or a negative trend here? No, we are absolutely we're soaring right now, and I honestly believe we have this NWSL for women's soccer, WNBA. Uh, we talked earlier yeah. at the beginning about this is the 50th anniversary of Title IX. I honestly be, be, I feel this is the jumping off point. This is really what Title IX was trying to do in the awareness, 
in the um, facilitation, the visibility, uh, the value of women in sports, and the power that they have outside of the lines of whether it's the basketball court, sure. the football field, the swimming pool, you know, the tennis, whatever it is. For so long, men have have um, they have enjoyed without probably thinking about it what your sports contacts have done for you. You know, what are the lessons you've learned that have facilitated your next opportunity in business, the yeah. relationship going out to the golf course and doing a deal, you know, while you mosey down the, the ninth fairway. And, you know, I believe, and when I hear people like Serena Williams and her husband, Alexis Ohanian, and they say, women's soccer is the next big thing. Mm -hmm. You better believe it. You better believe it. And if you haven't invested in women in sports and you haven't invested in women in soccer, you better get your act together because you're going to miss out. And it's the richest, deepest, most untapped well of resources that we have because you think of the population of people who play sports and this population over here, this bucket is yeah. massive. Yeah. And no one's like, hey, come on. I want you in my leadership or I yeah. want you as my CEO or I, I see that you're valuable. And... That, it's happening. Wow. Awesome. That's incredible. Well, listen, uh, thank you very, very much for, for hanging out with us and, and talking about this and everything. I really appreciate it. This is my favorite part, by the way. Just, just so you know, audience, uh, <laughs> I wanted to thank you today for listening in. I want you to know we're on every platform. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. We know how to do Instagram. We know all this stuff. So like us, DM us, <laughs> talk to us. Uh, and again, thank you very much. This wraps up another episode of Flip Your Friday. And uh, that's a wrap. Thank you, Brandy. Incredible. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Love it. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>